everybody to uh, this evening's lecture um, and invite you to continue to take care of yourselves as needed, which is, means if you need to get more food, please do so. And if you need to get something else to drink, please do so. If you need to go to the restroom, please sort yourself out down that way. Uh, I love seeing everybody here. We've got a lot of people from St. James, a lot of people not from St. James, which we love. You are very welcome here. Thank you for coming. Um, and if you end up watching this online, we welcome you here too. This is the second installment of our Lenten lecture series, Women of the Old and New Testament. And this evening we're going to talk about Esther. Um, so um, the way I'm going to try to do this, I'm going to spend about the first five minutes talking a little bit about the book of Esther and locating that in history. You guys know I love history. All of these lectures are just an excuse for me to teach history. So, you know, this is the first five minutes is my, always my favorite part. <laughs> um, but just a few things, a few uh, highlights about the book of Esther. Some of you, you don't have to raise your hand, but I know some of you are thinking, I've never even heard of the book of Esther. I, I mean, I vaguely am aware there might have been a woman in the Bible named Esther, but there is actually a book of Esther. Um, it is only one of two books in the entire Bible named after a woman. Anybody want to take a stab at the other one? Ruth. Ruth. Very good. Ruth, we have a whole book named after you. Yes. Um, I looked it up. We only read in, in the revised common lectionary that we all use, and a lot of our churches use, um, Esther comes up exactly once in three years. Okay. <laughs> And of course, at that time, it's one of those ones readings where it jumps around all the time. And so I can promise you, no one ever preaches on Esther whenever she rolls around. It's, uh, it seems to come out of nowhere and leave quickly. Um, but it's a pretty fabulous and interesting book. So interestingly enough, and maybe in Christian circles, Esther is not particularly well known. In Jewish circles, the book is very well known. It's read in its entirety in synagogue every spring at the festival of Purim. And I'm going to say a little bit more about that uh, at the end of this lecture. But uh, whereas we barely know uh, of Esther, it is um, our, our, our Jewish brethren are very familiar with her and her book. Now, as we, as we get into this story, I, I need to frame it. I want you to think of Esther as it is. It's, it's, a, it's a kind of historical fiction. So it is rooted in a real time, actually in a real place, and there are characters in the book who are real people, namely Xerxes, the uh, Persian king. Um, however, uh, that's about where the, well, and actually there, clearly the author had some sort of familiarity with how uh, the, the Persian empire was ruled and how the, uh, and, uh, a little bit how the court worked. But other than that, it's, it, it is important to note that the, this is a fictional account. Um, now, the set. Um, unfortunately, for at least one person in this room, uh, the setting does not involve the Phoenicians. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> David. <laughs> Um, so, okay, let me get you oriented in history. If you remember, there was, um, in, in 586 and 587, the, the immensely powerful Babylonian Empire um, put siege to Jerusalem, and after two years of siege works on the walls, broke through the walls, and um, laid waste to the city of Jerusalem. This is under King Nebuchadnezzar, and exiled, um, a third of the Jewish population to all around the Babylonian Empire. That's 586, 587 BC. In 539, so roughly 50 years later, um, the Babylonian Empire falls to Cyrus, King Cyrus uh, of the Persian Empire. He was also sometimes referred to as an Assyrian. But this is the start, 539 is the start of the great Persian Empire. I put a map of the Persian Empire on your tables and you can see it was extensive. 
from as far east as the Indus River Valley, so we're talking Pakistan and Western India, all the way to the Mediterranean, to the Baltic states and Northern Egypt. That was the extent of, of, uh, of, the, of the Persian Empire. This is established under this King Cyrus, under this Emperor Cyrus. And Cyrus was, um, you know, so, he, so all of that was under Babylonian control is now under, um, is now under Persian control, including the Phoenicians. <laughs> Not only the Phoenicians, <laughs> but uh, this is going to be a running joke all night. Yes, so that. Uh, um, <laughs> uh, now Cyrus governed a little differently than Nebuchadnezzar had. So Cyrus um, allowed the Jews who had been, you know, in exile, allowed them to return to Jerusalem, and so many did. Um, and that began the rebuilding of the second temple in Jerusalem. Um, and that was a great time of renaissance for the Jewish people. However, as we're going to find out, um, despite all of the, all the, the party line that all Jews should return to uh, Jerusalem, not all did. And many remained in this huge diaspora uh, of, of the of Semites that, that lived throughout the Persian Empire. Um, Esther and her brother and her cousin Mordecai, we're gonna, who we're going to hear about here in a sec, um, were, were, such a, were such as that. So the book is set in the time of um, King Xerxes, who is one of the, maybe the great-great-grandson, of, maybe great-great-great-grandson of, of, uh, of Cyrus, and um, maybe around 480-ish. Um, that's kind of the setting is about 480 BC. Um, and so the, the Jews, many had returned to Jerusalem, but there still was a huge uh, diaspora throughout all of the Persian Empire um, of Jews. It should be noted that um, that, that, was, uh, that even among the modern day Jews, there's a little bit of a question of like, well, why didn't everybody go back? They were all supposed to go back. And I think you, could, you can kind of think about that. Like, if, if 50 years had passed from the first exile to the time of return, well, that's almost two generations. All right, and now we're even two or three generations after that. So at least four, maybe five generations have passed since the exile to get us to the time of Esther and her, and her cousin uh, Mordecai. So that kind of gives us the, uh, that's kind of the setup uh, for what we've got going here today. Around 480 BC, this is, a, this is a historical fiction that happens in the court of Xerxes. All right, so well, now all of this, by the way, is found in the book of Esther, in, in the Bible. <coughs> um, so here's, the, here's how the narrative goes. Here is the story. This is a great romantic, sort of romantic story. King Xerxes is the emperor of the Persian Empire, and he throws a huge party. It lasts 180 days. Um, and apparently, after about 180 days, he had run out of things that he wanted to brag about. So he started bragging about his wife, whose name was Vashti. Apparently a stunner, a great beauty. But Vashti was off having her own party. And I guess Xerxes was having a party for the guys. And you can only imagine guys getting together. and They were definitely lit up. and, and, and at some point, Xerxes says, "Ah, oh, you guys, my wife's so hot. Uh, uh, we'll, get, let's, we'll get her in here. You can see how hot she is. And so he, he commands, he sends his eunuchs out to get, uh, to get Vashti, who refuses to come. She stands up to him. Xerxes does not like this. So he, uh, he immediately banishes Vashti. And that's actually the last we hear of her. She's either banished or maybe probably killed. Okay. So now, uh, and the king, <laughs> uh, we'll get to the feminist critique of all this here in a little while. <laughs> uh, the king then makes this edict that all women have to obey the men in their household. Uh, this goes out over the entire land of, over the entire Persian Empire. Boom. <laughs> uh, but, the king is now without a wife. 
So he begins what is famously thought of sometimes as the first beauty pageant. He conscripts all of the attractive young maidens in his capital city of Susa, and perhaps from the greater environs. And whether they're rounded up or they're offered up voluntarily, it's not clear, but it seems as if hundreds of maidens are sort of brought into his harem. And he is going to audition for his new wife. Of course, the way you audition for a new wife is you sleep with one of them every night until you get to one that you just thought was great, and then that's who you're going to marry. Well, this goes on until Esther, uh, who was caught up in this uh, conscription uh, and, and sort of sponsored by her cousin Mordecai. Esther was a, was a so she was a, a, a Jewish maiden, a Jewish girl, probably a teenager, uh, who was living and under the care of her cousin Mordecai. Her parents had died and Mordecai had taken her in. Um, and they were Jewish, but they had they were hiding their cultural identity just for the sake of, I think, their safety um, and perhaps professional advancement for Mordecai, who was involved as a palace guard um, on the outskirts of the, of the Persian palace of the king. So, uh, and anyway, so, so Esther had been caught up in the conscription of this and uh, apparently was very pleasing to the king uh, when it was her night. And so he marries her and she becomes his queen. All right, so she wins. So if you ever, this, this comes up in uh, trivia every now and then, who won the first beauty pageant? It's Esther, okay? All right, now. Now the plot starts to thicken. So, so Esther is now queen. Mordecai is still working on the palace gates. Um, however, there is a, uh, a noble, a nobleman by the name of Haman, who is, uh, from the word go, he's, he's succeedingly anti-Semitic. And he does not like the Jews. And he gets into this kind of tiff with, um, with Mordecai at the gate. But Mordecai does not give uh, Haman the deference that he feels he deserves. And Haman is basically one of the highest ranking nobles in all of Persia. And he goes to the king after being slighted by Mordecai and suggests that all of the Jews should be exterminated uh, because of this slight that uh, Mordecai uh, did to Haman. And, and the king is persuaded by this. And so he makes this edict. All Jews should be um, on the 13th of the month of uh, Adar, which is a, a, one of the Hebrew months. On the 13th of Adar, all Jews in Persia are going to be killed. Well, um, Mordecai hears about this, about this edict. And he, he gets word to Esther. Um, he's not allowed to, you know, go into the castle and talk to Esther, but, but he gets word to Esther, and they have some communication between these sort of eunuchs who are running back and forth as messengers. And he says to Esther, you've got to do something about this. You've got to, you have to step in to save your people. And Esther is reluctant, um, because I think she knows the fate of Vashti. I think everybody knows that, like, okay, if, you know, if, if you make trouble for the king, clearly things don't end well. And, the, and it was well known that if you approach the king in his court, not having been invited, he just has your head taken off. So he's she, so she's telling Mordecai, her, her cousin, I can't even approach the king. I have to wait for him to call. Him. And he's and he's kind of haggling with Esther. He says, No, you've got to do something. You have to step in to save your people. So she asks Mordecai to pray. Um, and, and, and fast and to convince other Jews in, in, in the city of Susa to, to do this. And she herself prays and fasts. And after three days, she gets all dolled up and she goes to see uh, King Xerxes in the court. And he sees her and he says, wow, you know, you like her. So she invites her in and he's there with Haman, who is, you know, his prime noble. And she just, she sort of in a crafty way invites the two of them to dinner. Is that? <laughs> it's King Xerxes. Better call him. <laughs> so she has them over to dinner, and, and although even at that first dinner, she doesn't really screw up the courage to kind of 
tell King Xerxes what she wants to tell him. So she invites him again to dinner the next night. But the second dinner, she reveals that she's Jewish and that um, uh, and that Haman has been has put up, you know, that the, uh, she basically asks the king to save the Jewish people. Do not, you know, do not put out this edict that uh, that will kill all the, Jew, the Jewish people. And in the meantime, um, you know, Haman has actually been plotting to kill Mordecai and had erected a one. Some Bible translations say a gallows, but it was really more of a of a pole on which uh, people were impaled. And so she, he, Haman had, was scheduled to impale Mordecai the next morning. And somehow Esther convinces uh, the king to, um, to, uh, to arrest Haman and to save, uh, to, you know, so that she, and, and actually the king has Haman impaled on, on the big spike. Um, and then, you know, once, you're, once you've made an edict like all, you know, like the Jews can be killed, uh, you can't rescind that, but you can make another edict, which he did, which says the Jews can rise up against and slaughter anybody that's trying to harm them. So that second edict goes out, and then on, so as the, on the 13th of, uh, uh, I gotta get the, the uh, on Adar, on the 13th of Adar, there is this rising up, but then on the 14th and 15th, the Jews basically attack and slaughter over the course of all of the, the Persian Empire, 75,000 Gentiles who had risen up against them. So, uh, so in this way, uh, Esther orchestrates this, the, she essentially saves the entire Jewish diaspora in the kingdom of Persia. She manages to get Amman, who was conspiring to kill her cousin, killed himself and his family is killed too. Uh, and as a result of all of this, um, less significant for us, very significant for Jews, um, she establishes the festival of Purim, uh, which is one of the larger Jewish festivals um, of uh, in the Jewish faith. And it's at this uh, festival that that um, that the entire book of Esther is read every year, and it's a it's a it's a time for sort of dressing up for good food, um, and is part of uh, the I think long-standing sort of a joke among uh, Jewish scholars and rabbis um, and and scholars of the Old Testament of the Hebrew Scriptures that you know Jewish festivals are are all sort of originate like oh they tried to kill us. It didn't happen. Let's see. <laughs> uh, and so that is sort of the. By the way, there's there's a lot to that. Um, a lot of the, you know, you think of uh, even um, uh, Hanukkah is, is is in some ways, you know, a little bit about that. So anyway, uh, that's sort of the great. That's sort of the narrative of of, of what of of, of Esther. Um, I want to kind of give maybe five minutes of reflection about all of this, about this story. Um, and some things, because Esther, a lot of tension, particularly um, if, you're, if you're involved with like feminist scholarship or gendered studies, um, Esther gets a lot of attention. And so there's a lot of critique that gets thrown back and forth about this book and about Esther herself. Um, interestingly enough, God is not mentioned once in this entire Bible. And one of the critiques that uh, that is sometimes thrown from a Jew, well, um, one one critique that is sometimes thrown around, um, it's not a Jewish critique because, um, but it is a critique that gets thrown around, is that you know, Esther had never gone back to Jerusalem. She should have she should have been in Jerusalem, and the temple was never mentioned, and and um, so so the homeland and the and God are never a part of this book. So like, how does this make it into? The Christian canon, you know, and by the way, there are lots of people who tried to get it out of the canon. Uh, Martin Luther hated this book and thought it was the work should not have been in the in the, in the Christian canon at all. Um, but I think, due to its popularity, with um, you know, I think it is it is a rock solid part of the of the Jewish canon of the, of the Hebrew scriptures, and I think that's how it has ended up 
um, in our in our Bible as well. Um, and of course, you know, she sometimes Esther gets a little shade for not for having high, hidden her identity as a Jew. Although I think you can give her some a pass on that. I mean, if you are living in the diaspora and uh, it was a threat to your life and your well-being, um, you know, your cultural identity. Yeah, maybe she sought to pass as a Persian, you know, to, for her own benefit. And even Mordecai, I think, was doing the same thing. This book, interestingly enough, is, I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting comment, commentary on patriarchy. Um, if you remember, we talked yesterday, last week, about, about um, Deborah and how Deborah was an interesting commentary on patriarchy as well and how um, it was the treatment of women were uh, and was a sign of how close a community was with God in the sense that the worse the women were treated and the less power they had, the further from God the community was. Um, I think there's a, not a similar, but maybe a, 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 a well, a, some commentary about patriarchy because you have two different modes of resistance to, to the patriarchy and the monarchy of the king that are happening here. You start with Vashti, who is headstrong, she's assertive, she defies the patriarchy and, uh, and re completely refuses to yield to the king's petty, clearly a petty objectifying wish that, that whatever the king had planned for Vashti to do in front of all his buddies. And of course, she's heavily punished for this, right? Um, either killed or banished, never to be heard from again. But it's interesting, some of the, the classic um, women's rights people of our country, even Harry Beecher Stowe and Elizabeth Cady Stanton talk, you know, they praise Vashti for her resistance as the first stand for women's rights and a sublime representative of self-centered womanhood. Um, and you contrast that with Esther, who is docile, submissive. She, she comes off as the perfect queen. She clearly jumped through great hoops to please the king to become her, uh, his queen. Um, she dutifully obeys the commands of Mordecai, her cousin, and Xerxes the king, the two men in her life, until um, their conflicting expectations become at odds with each other, and she has she's kind of forced into action. Um, and even then, however, you know, Esther kind of proceeds cautiously. She acts with care in a kind of measured way, saving the Jewish people while remaining in the good graces with the king. So it's interesting. She's unimaginably brave, but in some ways she's still sort of complicit in the patriarchal rule, uh, playing by the king's rules and bending them just enough to prevent um, a Jewish genocide. Um, it's also kind of worth pointing out that unlike Vashti, who was Persian, Esther is, you know, a hidden member in this exiled community and cannot, maybe did not feel that she had the kind of overt agency that Vashti thought that she had. Um, I think, honestly, in, in the way that this story is a, is a romantic uh, historical fiction, uh, it, honestly, in some ways, the king kind of is the real villain here because he, he comes off as you know fickle and capricious. He makes these sweeping, you know, edicts that that goes over the entire. I mean, this is fiction, right? But but you know, the, all men must obey their wives in the house, and he sends letters to the four corners of the Persian Empire, um, and he's so easily uh, manipulated by Haman to, to 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 destroy all the Jews. And then when it gets down to it, Esther is pretty easily able to like flip the tables on him. Uh, and, you know, get Haman killed and save the Jews. Uh, so, you know, he's not made to look. So, so while th there is a resistance to patriarchy, the king himself is not made to look particularly um, powerful or smart or graceful. Um, I think in the end, you know, I think it's important that, you know, to think that both Vashti and Esther can be celebrated as heroes in their own ways. You know, well, Esther is initially this role of this passive consort. Um, you know, and the replacement to the willful queen, um, you know, she knows that she is meant to, she has to embody the antithesis of what Vashti was, but she eventually musters the same courage that Vashti has, even if that means risking her life and her kingdom. And she does risk her life by going before that king uh, when she was not called 
she knew she was putting her life in danger. Um, and it, at the end of the day, you know, it's her mild mannered temperament that actually is her saving grace as it enables her to access spaces that others cannot uh, and eventually subvert, you know, subvert those qualities of the king to save the day. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a, um, I, I kind of invite you to, you know, think about, well, I invite you to make your own uh, uh, decisions about this, you know, uh, about, you know, people throw a lot of shade at Esther because, you know, she was hiding her identity and because she wasn't uh, the way she approached the king. But, you know, was there another way to do that? Is this a, was this a commentary on the patriarchal rule of the Persians? Um, all of that is the kind of stuff that scholars love to talk about. <laughs> um, one of the things that's just wonderful, though, and I'll close with this before I open up the questions, is that, you know, that what's wonderful and unique about Esther's story is that the safety of the Jewish people is dependent on a female herald <coughs> who takes a stand against a patriarchal monarchy. And thus, uh, in, this, and in this major celebration in the Jewish calendar, links Jewish liberation directly to um, the feminist, to a woman, to a female experience. Um, and so that, and that's what that festival of Purim, uh, which we don't know a lot about, but um, is, you know, is, major, is a major part of the Jewish faith is all about. So uh, we were almost annihilated. So let's eat. <laughs> okay, if you have questions, about anything other than the Phoenicians, <laughs> now is a good time to ask. <laughs> now, I'm happy to answer any questions as, as best I can. For those of us who weren't here last week, what's the joke about the Phoenicians? <laughs> well, the joke was last year, last week's lecture had nothing to do with the Phoenicians except. Yeah. Some Dave Hammond theory. just decided to introduce the concept. Now, that's not true, actually. <laughs> the, the Canaanites and the Phoenicians are more or less the same thing. Uh, different name for the same, for the same people. And uh, the, the Phoenicians were... Uh, you know, a, <laughs> and, and it's a that that's kind of a thing because you know in the Bible when it talks about Canaanites, um, they, those are the same people that the Greeks refer to as Phoenicians. Speaking of the Greeks referring to things, uh, the word Persia is a Greek word, and the Persians, what you would call Persians, yeah. would never call themselves Persian. Yeah, it was because the Persians don't like the Greeks so much. Right. And also, the letter P doesn't exist now. What did they call themselves? They called themselves Fars, or if you go back far enough, they, they call themselves Aryans, uh -huh. which is the same origin, the same word that you think of, probably. Yeah. But there is no P in the Persian alphabet or the Iranian alphabet. I just have to throw that. I had to say that. I know. You have to. Yeah. Yes. Greg. I married the king of youth and separation. <laughs> Greg. Well, I just want to make sure everybody knows that the Greeks defeated Xerxes. <laughs> That's true. Just to be clear. Yeah. This would be Alexander? No. This was before the Battle of Salamina. Okay. When, they, when the Persians invaded uh, Greece. Uh -huh. Salamina is just south of Athens. <laughs> the island of Salamina. Thank you. <laughs> yes, Sandy. What was the, uh, when Jerusalem was walled about this time, what was their population? <laughs> I don't know. Joseph, you know? I, I, I think maybe around 100,000, but it might be less. Within the walled city. Of Jerusalem? Yeah. yeah. I'm not sure. That's my guess. You yeah. have a guess on that? You know, when they came back from Babylon, there, were, there was there was just a mixture of people, and they were put, trying to get themselves back together. And everybody, all, all the 
all the people that were in Samaria that didn't get taken on the cruise, didn't get taken to Babylon, ended up marrying the locals. It caused a lot of problems, and that's why mm -hmm. Samaria's Samaritans are not loved. Yeah. Um, but I don't, I don't know how many people were in the city. Yeah. I'm not sure. Just wondering how crowded it was. I think it was kind of crowded there for a little while because of the, the siege, the two year siege to get, to get through those yes. walls. So you, they're slowly running out of everything, you know, during that. Yes. I'm kind of reluctant to, to say this because I'm, I'm not, I don't know if it'll all flesh out, but you know, it, um, the taming of the shrew has um, at the end Petruchio having this contest. Yeah. With the people in the room, you know, let's see who calls their wife and who comes, you know, and um, and then uh, Catherine comes out and she she gives this speech about how we should serve and obey and um, and really she's saying, you know, let's use this weakness to our strength. Yeah. I mean, there's a debate about that, of course. Right. But in the musical *Kiss and Kate*, that's exactly what's <laughs> that's exactly what's going on. She is saying, oh, "I'll come out and I'll do what you say," but it's because I know I will get my way. You know. So it's interesting that this. I wonder if um, Shakespeare ever thought about Esther, the Book of Esther, when he wrote that last act of the taking of the shrew. It's kind of interesting that yeah, you, you you know being subservient. But because you know that it can be powerful, uh -huh. you know, or, and I don't mean that in a in a manipulative sort of deceptive way, you know. But there's a lot you can think about even in terms of your relationship to God, you know, being letting go and not trying to hold on to. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, that's a great point. You know, I grew up in a Southern culture, and it was always obvious to me that the women pretended that the men were in charge. <laughs> but, but they were really the ones who made all the decisions to pull all the strings. Yeah. It was really, it was a matriarchy that pretended to be a patriarchy. That's good. <laughs> That's where the term yes dear came from. <laughs> Colleen, I didn't know if you had anything to add. I mean, I know you you created a lot of experience with the yep. with the Orthodox Jewish community. And, and I was never obviously invited to the forum, but it was a day off <laughs> because they did celebrate yeah. and they dressed up, and I saw plenty of pictures. And of course, that's where the cookie hamantash uh -huh. came from. Yeah, and um, you know you're. They're celebrating that they got them out of out of their lives. Yeah. But um, I don't have anything historical. It it's truly the only thing that they ever everybody looked forward to because it was a party. Yeah. So you were right. They yeah. Said, okay. We, we managed. Uh, let's eat. Yeah. <laughs> hey. Um, do you know who wrote, who was credited? With we don't. Uh, we, it's 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 probably here's what we can guess about that. It was we think it was probably written fifty to a hundred years later after the setting is set. So so maybe in the early four well you know around four hundred or somewhere at that time. Uh, if the book is set in four eighty, it was it was written around BC. It was written around four hundred. It was clearly somebody who um, was probably part of the Jewish diaspora and um, and familiar enough with the with the Persian way of doing things, you know, uh, whether or not you know Xerxes had a harem that was that big, those those kings seem to have had harems, um, and the way the the eunuchs were used to send messages back and forth and, and the kind of the layout of the court. And early in the book, there's some descriptions of these castles and the description of that 180 day party that, that, that Xerxes throws. And so there was some familiarity. So, so clearly they think somebody maybe in that region or in Susa in Persia who had been around um, was right. So that's, that's the best guess so far. I mean, you say it's historical fiction. What part is historical and what part is 
<laughs> well, just the, Xerxes is, was the real king. I mean, that that's a real person. Um, he did have a capital there. You know, he did have eunuchs, and you know, there he did throw lavish parties. But there was not like the the, the person. There's no record of Esther, and and uh, I don't remember. I didn't write it down, but. There was his queen was well known. Uh, it's not her name was not Vashti. I can't remember what her name was, but it wasn't Vashti, and I, she wasn't chucked out for not parading naked with you know in front of the in front of the guys. Um, so uh, yeah, that's so that's what I'm saying. It's like there's a setting with real people in a real place, but but the characters are not. Most of the characters are not. Okay. Last call. <laughs> All right. Next week we have. Um, next week is exciting. Joseph's going to be giving next week's presentation. We'll be talking about uh, Mary and Elizabeth and Mary's mother Anne, um, and so bringing all sorts of biblical and non-biblical uh, material in, to bear on that. We look forward to that. Too. <laughs> <laughs> the following week after that, uh, Amy will be doing uh, on will be presenting on Phoebe, who was a, a deacon and a leader in the early Christian church, um, and somebody uh, <laughs> definitely held her own and, and financed her own way around. So that's going to be cool to hear from that. And then we'll we finish up with Mary Magdalene, um, uh, who I can't wait to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. Any other questions? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Next week, thank you, Lydia. Next week, because of this event going on at um, Carnegie Hall, one night only, uh, in which um, I expect all of you there because my daughter's performing. Uh, uh, anyway, Lucia's performing, and a lot of youth from our uh, are performing in that. And so we're going to start half an hour early, 5 30. So we can wrap up a little bit early so, so any of us who are interested can get over to Carnegie Hall for that. So like if you see that on Facebook, share it. Yes. And we'll make yeah. that announcement. Joseph, are you going to talk any about the Phoenicians next week? <laughs> <laughs> he is now. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, this is all about the, the time when Jesus was, was born. So uh -huh. and then preceded that. We were blue and purple. Okay. Uh, nice tie-in. Did you like that? That was good. <laughs> Thank you all. Great job. Appreciate it.